Welcome to Let's Pod Crime. What better way to start 2021 when everyone's miserable, sick of COVID and the amazing governments across the world than talking about rape, murder, kidnap, robbery, cults and many, many other crimes committed. We'll be bringing you one topic per week and giving you the complete rundown on what happened. If you want a story you would like covered, please drop by our Discord or tweet me at the study dog, all one word. But for the very first episode, where better to start than with Britain's very first serial killer? This week, I'll be covering Mary Ann Cotton. She was born on the 31st of October 1832 to Michael Robson and Margaret Nee Lonsdale. What a fitting day for such a vile, horrible creature to be born on. She was born in Low Moseley, a small village just outside of Hettenley Hall in Sunderland, which means she might actually be the worst ever Mackham to have lived. From what I can find due to conflicting reports, she was one of three children, however her sister was born in 1834, two years after Anne, however sadly died. She only lived a few months. Her brother was born in 1835, and when Anne was eight years old, the family moved to Merton, a small mining village in County Durham. Soon after the move, her father, who was a coal miner and had a hard working life, passed away when he fell down the mine shaft and fell approximately 150 feet and died instantly. Due to the property they lived in being tied to Michael's job, the family was soon evicted from the home, resulting in Mary having to grow up very quickly and join the workforce to help provide for the family instead of having the childhood she should have. In 1843, her mother remarried to a man called George Stott, which is the name of my actual dad. Am I related to her? Very small chance, but would be interesting if I was. At the age of only 16 years old, she moved out of the family home, with some sources claiming that George assaulted her numerous times. She moved to South Heaton, so still fairly local, and became a nurse in a private home for Edward Potter, a manager at the Merton Coal Colliery. However, at the age of 20, when all three of Edward's children had been sent off to boarding school down Darlington, she returned home and retrained as a dressmaker. Now that we know her backstory and that she might have had knowledge with regards to medicine and medical disorders, as well as what was toxic and poisonous due to her working for Edward Potter, let's get back to what she's really famous for and why she became Britain's first ever serial killer and nicknamed the Dark Angel. Mary Ann was found guilty of murdering three of her four husbands, one lover, her mother, and unbelievably, eleven, one one, one higher than ten, eleven of her own children. It's believed to be around 21 people that Mary killed in total. She was regarded and given the ominous title of being Britain's deadliest killer up until the end of the 20th century, when Harold Chipman stepped in and became the most prolific killer of modern times with approximately 250 kills. Anyway, back to Mary. If you do want us to do a pod on Shipman, let us know in the comments. Or tweet us, or contact us somehow. Mary was described as being strikingly beautiful, so had no problems with attracting lovers and husbands. She first married at the age of 20 years old in 1852 to William Mowbray. Not much is mentioned about him other than the fact that he worked as a colliery labourer. They moved away from the northeast of England and moved to the southeast, believed to be around the Plymouth area. During this time period, at her trial, there were reports stating that the couple had five children, four of whom died. However, none of this can be proven as births and deaths were not always registered at the time. It was compulsory to do so, but wasn't enforced until 1874. The only recorded childbirth that they registered was in 1856, their daughter, Margaret Jane. The couple, with their young daughter, moved back to the northeast, where William got a job as a fireman on a steam vessel, then became a colliery foreman. The couple had their second, and I use quotations there due to the possible previous four dead children, second child in 1856, Isabella. However, just two years later, at the age of four, Margaret Jane died. One year later, in 1861, the couple had their next child, which strangely they named Margaret Jane. Also as an admission of guilt, perhaps, or simply grieving their daughter. Who knows? Their final child, John Robert William, was born in 1863, but died a year later from gastric fever. Remember that, gastric fever becomes very, very prominent here. William died in January 1865, leaving Mary with two young girls to look after, 
Thankfully for Mary, William and the children were insured and she was able to collect £35 for William's death, which in a day's money is roughly three and a half grand, about half a year's salary for labourer back in those days. She was also able to claim £2 for John's death. So we are currently one dead husband, two, possibly six dead children in. After these events, Mary moved to Seam, another northeast town in County Durham, where she met and had a relationship with Joseph Natteris. Sadly, now at the age of three and a half, Margaret Jane died of typhoo, typhoo fever. Easy for non geordies to say. Dying at a very similar age to a namesake that died in 1860. I will add at this point that during these times, families were very hard up and struggling on a daily basis. In general, daily resources would have been a struggle to get, especially in the northeast of England. This left Mary with just one child, Isabella. Mary returned to work, working at the Sunderland Infirmary House of Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fevers Dispensary and Human Society, or in today's name, Sunderland Royal Hospital. Isabella was sent to go and live with her grandmother, Margaret. While working at the hospital, Mary met, and guess what, got married again, to a George Ward, an engineer who was a patient there. They were married in August 1865, however George continued to suffer with problems, and in the October of 1866 he died, with his death certificate stating that he died of English cholera and typhoid. typhoid. His doctor stated that George had been very ill but was surprised just how quickly he died. Thankfully for Mary, George had been insured, and she was able to collect on Piaut on him. We now stand at two dead husbands, and three or seven dead kids. In 1866, Mary started working for James Robinson as a housekeeper. James was recently widowed with young children. I can't find out the exact number, however, from what you will soon hear. He would have had to have at least five. By this point, Mary Ann would have been 34 years old and would have arguably been at the peak of her striking beauty. And in James's eyes, she was single without children, assuming he didn't know about Isabella. However, after a month of working there, the youngest of James' children, John, who was still a baby, died of gastric fever, just like her own son did back in 1863, who by chance was also called John. Looking for comfort, James turned to Mary, where she became pregnant once again. At the same time, Mary Ann's mother, Margaret, became ill with hepatitis. She immediately rushed to her side and saw him. Although Margaret began to recover, she soon started to complain of stomach pains. She died just nine days after Mary arrived to assist her at her home. Isabella, from Mary Ann's first marriage and her only surviving child at this point, moved in with her and her new stepfather, James. However, guess what? Yep, she too would soon start to develop severe stomach pains and sadly died. James' two other children, Elizabeth and James, also died. However, I couldn't find anything to suggest either death were via gastric problems. Despite all the heartache and loss in the family, it must have pulled them closer together, as they were married in the August of 1867. Mary gave birth to Mary Isabella, their first child together, in the November of that year. She would only live for four months, dying in the February of 1868. Seventeen months later, though, the couple had their second child, George. Mary Ann started to insist that James got life insurance, which he refused to do so, and it made him become very suspicious of her. He would soon find out that Mary Ann had run up debts of around £60 or £4,000 in days' money behind his back. She had also stolen approximately £50 she was expected to pay back to the bank. It was a final straw for him when he found out from his eldest children that she was forcing them to steal valuables from the household for her to pawn off. James had enough and would throw Mary Ann out of the house, retaining custody of their child, George. So now we are at two dead husbands, a dead mother, five dead children of her own, two of James's children that are dead, but it could be 11 children dead in total. Who knows? After being thrown out, Mary Ann was living on the streets when her friend, Margaret Cotton, introduced her to her brother. Frederick Cotton, a pitman who was a recent widower and living in Warbottle in Northumberland. He had four children, however two of them had already sadly passed away before he met Mary Ann, Frederick James and Charles being the two surviving children. 
Margaret had been acting as a mother to the two remaining children. However, in March 1870, she died from, yep, undetermined stomach problems. However, Mary was right there, ready to console the grieving man. Shortly afterwards, she fell pregnant once again. And in the September of that year, they were married, and she was on to her fourth and final husband. Early in 1871, she gave birth to Robert, their only child together. Once again, with Mary Ann, something, someone, always seemed to be right around the corner. And soon after getting married to Frederick, she learned that her former lover, Joseph Natras, was living roughly 30 miles away in West Auckland, County Durham. Strangely enough, the family soon moved to the area of West Auckland. By this point, I'm sure you can tell what cycle is about to happen. Frederick became ill and died from, yep, stomach problems and gastric fever. And once again, Mary collected life insurance, which thankfully she had recently set up covering him and his sons. A few months after his passing, Joseph moved in with Mary as a lodger to help cover the cost of living. Even with him there and countless insurance payouts, she still had to work and get a job once again. She started working as a nurse for John Quick Manning, who was recovering from smallpox. I promise, I promise, 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 this isn't a repeat, there isn't a fault in the recording. But, a year went by before Frederick Jr. fell ill and passed away. Around the same time, her young infant, Robert, also died. Nothing is listed for their cause of death, however. Joseph Natras had recently revised his will and left everything in Marianne's favour. What an idiot guess what happened to him he soon died guess what from stomach problems and his death is listed as gastric fever quick manning and marianne soon became intimate with each other and she fell pregnant yet again at this stage i really really just wonder what her own internal organs were looking like so that takes the current count to i have no idea the count is uh, I don't know. It, it, I don't know. It was 150 years ago, but come on. This is unreal. Somebody must have been able to connect the dots somehow. Unbeknown to Mary Ann, she was about to slip up. She was asked by the parish official to help with nursing a woman back to health who was ill, who had been ill with smallpox. She refused, claiming that Charles, her last surviving stepson, would be in the way, and she would only be able to do so if he was committed to the workhouse. Thomas Riley, the parish official, refused and informed Mary Ann that she would have to accompany him. She replied to Riley, stating that the boy was sickly and, I won't be troubled long, he'll go like the rest of the cottons. Five days later, she informed Riley that Charles had died. Riley went straight to the village police, informing them of the goings-on. He also convinced the local doctor to delay writing the death certificate until the police could investigate the situation. Fully expecting her insurance payout for Charles, Mary Ann was shocked when the insurance company informed her that they would not be paying out until the death certificate was produced. The case would go to court, where a jury ruled the death of Charles as being from natural causes. Mary claimed to have used arrowroot to help relieve him of his illness, and she also claimed that Riley had made the accusations against her because she rejected his advances. However, local papers soon picked up on the story and soon discovered that Mary Ann had moved around a fair amount across the northeast and had lost three husbands, a lover, a father, a friend, a mother and 11 children, all of whom had died from stomach-related problems. One of the doctors, Dr. William Byes Kilburn, decided to run tests on Charles' stomach and intestines where he found trace evidence of arsenic which is highly toxic in its organic form, and if consumed over a brief period will result in severe abdominal pain and death if left untreated. Mary Ann Cotton was arrested and charged with the murder of Charles, Frank and Robert Cotton, along with Joseph Natras. However, she would eventually only be trialled for the murder of Charles. On the 10th of January 1873, Mary Ann Cotton would give birth to her final child, whom she named Margaret Edith quick manning cotton her trial began on the 5th of march and it would last only three days and take a jury only 90 minutes to find her guilty mary ann strongly believed that she would be granted royal clemency a pardon of sorts for the charge against her and insisted she was innocent several petitions were presented to the home secretary but to no avail 
11 days after being found guilty on the 24th of March 1873, at the age of just 40 years old, Mary Ann Cotton was hanged in Durham Jail. However, there was a problem with the trap door which wasn't set high enough, resulting in the hangman having to press down on her shoulders, choking her to death, which reportedly took three minutes instead of just snapping her neck instantly. So, finally got the end. Thank you for staying with me all the way. This was a long one, 21 murders against one person, had to be, but it felt like the victims deserved the time and energy. Or, was there no other victims other than Mary, being a victim to the era she lived in and the poor living working conditions, and simply being very unlucky in life? You decide. Join me next week for more Let's Pod Crime.